pivoting now, and this will be weird if you're listening on Anchor. I don't know what to tell you. This is just how this is breaking down. This is happening. We're going to talk Avengers Endgame because now it's been out for a full week. You've had your chance to see it. I will still give you the opportunity. If you haven't seen it yet and don't want it spoiled, this is not the segment to listen to. This is not the video to watch if you're watching it on YouTube. I am going to talk about Endgame here, uh, and I'm going to talk fairly openly about it. So get ready. Here's your last chance. Three, two, one. All right, here we go. Avengers Endgame. So uh, first and foremost, let me start by saying this. I thought Endgame was a really good kind of final chapter to this first mega saga they've been putting together, right? Like they went through phase three, uh, we got in game, and it felt like a satisfying conclusion for a lot of characters whose stories we have been following since 2008 was Iron Man. So really for his arc since then, the first Avengers movie in 2012, this was an incredible production from that standpoint. What I love first and foremost is we take a step back after the events of Infinity War, right? We immediately address the situation. We start on the farm, which is where Thanos has gone after the snap, where he has receded to. And you basically see the Avengers. It's been several weeks after then. Captain Marvel has shown up. Uh, of course, half of all existence is gone now as far as life in the universe. And the Avengers are basically in avenging mode. You have Tony Stark is lost. No one knows where he is. And you have, I think he's been gone actually 22 days. So he returns just in time, but he does not go on the adventure because he's been lost out in space for 20 something days, 22 days, I believe. This was the 22nd film, by the way, in the franchise for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So it makes some sense, a little Easter egg there. And so Captain Marvel, Thor, Captain America, Black Widow, uh, Hulk Buster, because we still don't have the situation with Hulk worked out yet. All of them just go ambush Thanos on the farm because they find the signature for the stones was used within a matter of days somewhere else in the universe. They're able to identify that and show up and uh, Captain Marvel goes and scouts it out ahead of time and she basically says, there's no one there. There's no army. There's nothing. And their thinking, of course, is, well, he's got the stones. He's got the gauntlet. He doesn't really need his army at this point. So they go and they ambush him and you see uh, the gauntlet's fucked up, his arm is fucked up, and Thanos does not seem like himself. It's basically like, in addition to just the physical damage that he has, he's pretty much content. Like, he he knows this is the final chapter, and he knows how this is ultimately going to play out for him. They ambush him, they think he's going for the gauntlet just because he's raising that arm, he's already wearing the gauntlet, and Thor with Stormbreaker flies in out of nowhere, hacks off the arm, Hey, that simple common sense thing they should have done at multiple opportunities in Infinity War. Yeah, I know. You got to have a movie. Cuts off his arm and they're confronting him. They got him in a headlock and he they basically see there are no Infinity Stones in the gauntlet. And in the confrontation, they're trying to figure it out. Thanos says, I destroyed them. Now that they've served their purpose, they would only invite trouble, basically. There would always be those who seek to do harm with them. And he's trying to do this whole self-righteous thing, right? And he's putting it off as if, you know, hey, I did what had to be done. It was the necessary thing. And at this point, my mindset is just uh, to protect the universe from the stones. As you come to find in the plot of the movie, it might have more so been his understanding of what they could allow to be undone. But Nebula basically says, you know, my father's a lot of things. He's not a liar. And so as he's basically trying to give some kind of half-assed apology to Nebula and all the torture he put her through the years, literally deconstructing her body and replacing it with cybernetic technology, Thor basically says, F it, I'm going for the head, and lops off Thanos' head. And you're just like, bro, we're 10 minutes into the movie and Thanos is dead. The, the stones are gone, Thanos is dead, what's happening? Flash forward to five years and they do this in such a cool way where it's just like, on the text appearing just in pieces. Five years later. No voiceover, just the text. And you're like, oh shit, okay. Like at that point I was like, all right, it's gonna be time travel. They're gonna do, do time travel, but the stone is gone. And this movie does a good job of suddenly making the Ant-Man uh, portion of the universe seem a lot more important. Basically, 
Ant-Man's been lost. He saw Ant-Man and the Wasp. He's been lost in the quantum realm uh, because while he was in there, the others were snapped away. Uh, Hope and her father um, all snapped away. And so Hank Pym, that was the name I was looking for, all snapped away. And so he's just been lost in there. And you see in this five years later, everyone's trying to move on. Captain America is doing the support group. Uh, I think there's a reference from one of the directors did a cameo in which he is basically in the support group talking about meeting another man. And for whatever notoriety it's worth, I know to some people this is a, a big thing. To me, uh, to me, a character is a character. I, I don't care if he was talking about meeting another man or a woman or anything. It's whatever. But you have the first uh, gay character, I guess, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which, hey, check one off the list. Move on. And so Cap's leading this group. You find out that Black Widow, whose hair is now crazy because she had it dyed blonde in Infinity War. Now it's almost completely grown out red. The blonde is just at the very end of her long hair. And for five years, she's basically been serving the role of Nick Fury, uh, directing the Avengers, basically trying to stop even disasters that aren't even supervillain related, but things to do with like oh there's a underwater earthquake in mexico in the gulf of mexico uh go do something about that and they're like we can provide some aid but it's an underwater earthquake there's not a whole lot to do and she's talking to like uh war machine roadie uh captain marvel rockets there i think and there might be one more they kind of play off a little bit of maybe uh i was gonna say sexual tension in the comics war machine and captain marvel do have a thing at one point and they kind of play off there that maybe there's a little chemistry. But, you know, whatever. Basically, Black Widow is just completely in tatters. She is... They really kind of change up her character where suddenly they're trying to say she is the glue that holds the whole thing together. I didn't really get that impression in past movies. I know she was kind of the uh, the thing for Hulk. Like, hey, big fella, like stroking his palm. Sun's getting real low. Like that whole thing. Like, I, I get it. But it, it still, to me, is... It felt like a little bit of a, like, okay, it's been five years. I, I guess I can accept it, but, you know, if you're wanting me to have seen this coming the whole way, I don't know if I fully agree with that. But uh, the first ridiculous event, there are things you can nitpick in this movie. The first ridiculous event is you're going to have Ant-Man freed from the quantum realm because a random, you know, his truck was, his truck that the whole machine was in for the quantum realm is just in a junkyard, basically. Not a junkyard, it's in some kind of uh, tow truck, you know, area, warehouse, whatever. And or, first of all, that the technology is still hooked up and works. But just a random rat crawls across the, the control panel and just, poof, there's Ant-Man. He hasn't aged, apparently. That's what they're telling us, at least. He's been gone five years, and to him, it was like five hours or something like that. And so it's just like, what? He sees everyone who's gone, goes, and he finds that the one character who hasn't gone is that his daughter, who, she had a weird age jump, because I always got the impression from watching the two Ant-Man movies that she was probably six to eight years old, and she looks full-fledged 16, 17 years old, something like that in this movie. So I was like... You're telling us it's been five years. She looks like she's aged twice that, but almost twice that, but, you know, whatever. Nitpicking. Um, so then he goes and he seeks out the Avengers. He's been at their compound before, and Black Widow and uh, Captain America see him, let him in, and basically you get the whole thing, and he basically says, I think I know how to undo this, and he talks about how in the quantum realm, time uh, works differently, and that was ex uh, explained in Ant-Man and the Wasp. For her mother, Hope's mother, where she was gone like 40 years. And yes, she had aged, but it wasn't the same or something to that effect. So that's his plan is it's crazy. It's like it takes an absurd amount of precision and the perfect formula to do it. But he believes, hey, we can undo the snap this way. They're like, well, we only know we know someone who can help us with that. So they go to Tony Stark, who... Before they went to go fight Thanos, Tony Stark had this huge blow up with Captain. I love, not just for the end where we'll get into all that, I love Robert Downey Jr.'s performance in this movie. His arc, particularly particularly his arc post Age of Ultron on, fantastic. Like, it really is. You see him in this moment kind of revert back in a way where he's... he's angry with cap there are a lot of callbacks to their conversation in avengers 2 age of ultron where he's basically like you know he talks about having this defense system like this satellite system around the planet that would basically 
act as a guard for them and how Cap opposed that. And maybe that's from Civil War. Maybe I'm crossing those two. But why he was wanting to do this. And Cap's like, uh, you know, we'll fight together. And Tony's like, if you do that, you know, if we do that, we'll lose. And then Cap's response is, well, then we'll lose together. Now that's literally played out. Because Cap fought him and opposed him at everything. And you know for Tony's character, everything he was doing after the first Avengers movie was trying to protect people. Because he had literally, as Iron Man 3 showed, panic attacks and anxiety. Couldn't sleep. He was just haunted by this realization that something bad is coming. And because he is this genius and one of the greatest heroes in this world, he basically feels this burden that he can't shake, and it's crushing him. And so even though he had some controversial ideas, some things he wanted to do that Captain America opposed and some of the other Avengers opposed, he's like, no, this was, I, I was right, and you screwed this up. There, We lost half of everybody. I lost the kid, in this case Spider-Man. You lost your friend. We lost all these people because of you and your refusal to see that I was right. Great moment. And he rips off the, uh, the arc reactor from his chest. And he basically, before he collapses, because he's so malnourished and uh, dystrophy and all that from all that time and space, he basically just quits. He's like, I'm done. He quits being Iron Man. And in that five years, you find that he has basically rehabbed himself. He's married to Pepper Potts and moved out. He kind of borrows this from, I think it's Age of Ultron that has it, where you have the... Uh, the farm like Hawkeye has, although Hawkeye's lost his entire family and he goes off the rails in this movie too. And he sets up there and he's basically started a family. He kind of borrows the cabin in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I'm not going to bother myself too much with it. Like he still does his research and still has his tech out there, but he's kind of, to the degree Tony Stark can and will, roughing it, so to speak. He has a now young four or five-year-old daughter and... That's his That's his world. That's his everything. And so when the Avengers, Captain America, Black Widow, Ant-Man, come to talk to him and pitch this idea and this theory, he first shoots it down saying it's way too absurd. It's not even a one in a million chance, but it, it wouldn't even work. Like, there's no way this would work, and all you would be doing is risking it. And so he's like, dude, look at my life. I've got everything now. I lost everything but now I've rebuilt from it stuff that I could never bear to lose. I'm not going to do that for just a one in a trillion shot or whatever. But because he is still uh, a hero in this case and because he is still who he is, he feels a duty to at least try. And so he starts spending time researching it and trying to figure out this formula. And eventually he does. He figures out exactly how to do it. In the meantime, the Avengers go and get Professor Hulk. Yeah, that's a weird thing in this movie that I don't like. Uh, I get that you got to change up the Hulk because he's a fairly one-dimensional character when you're talking about the Hulk himself, not Bruce Banner. And he gets his ass kicked, Hulk does, in the first m movie of this part, uh, Infinity War, just brutalized by Thanos. And it kind of sets up in a way where you're like, ooh, that rematch whenever Hulk gets out of his little uh, I'm hiding kind of thing he's doing. Whenever he gets out of that, ooh, this is going to be a great fight with Thanos. You don't get that. In the five years, you find... That, like is a thing in the comics, uh, Banner has basically found this perfect marriage between him and the Hulk, where it's basically Banner. Like, even the face of the Hulk now is basically Banner's. and But he's got the Hulk form. But he's in full control of his emotions and everything. So he's still a brilliant scientist, but he's got the Hulk's strength. But he doesn't have the Hulk's temper. And so it's, it's weird because suddenly it's like, I wanted you to still at least snap at some point, not snap but snap at some point and go revert to Hulk psycho mode. That would have been cool, but they don't give us that. So he tries a formula. It doesn't really work. And so he's kind of relegated to operating this machine, this now quantum realm machine that they have set up and they get everyone assembled and they're like, all right, we're going to go into the past. We're going to drop into these different points in time. And we're going to take the infinity stones before the event of the snap. Uh, you know, basically get there before Thanos. And they have limited amount of pin particles to do this, so that's a whole plot line they run with. Uh, they, end up, they end up going back to previous movies, so you have, like, in Avengers 1, the, the Battle of New York, you have Captain America, Iron Man, and now Professor Hulk 
there. And that's kind of a funny thing because it does a couple things. In addition to seeing one kind of small plot hole I thought was fixed, you know, you have the uh, the guys from the Doctor Strange world and everything. Like, well, they're in New York. Why weren't they helping during the the invasion, the Chitari invasion? Well, it turns out they were. They are just doing it in a very subtle, low-key way that no one even knew they were there. So that's shown in kind of a different part of the battle that you don't see in the re- regular Avengers movie. So I thought that was a nice touch. Uh, you see Hulk losing his shit, and in a funny moment, you have Professor Hulk kind of like, like he's embarrassed for himself to even look at it. And so they're like, well, you know, if you're gonna, if we're gonna basically not alert anybody that something's off, basically you got to run around while you're trying to help us get all this shit, and you got to kind of play that role now. So he's going around and like half-heartedly, like rawr, kind of like beating up cars, but not really raging out. It's just, it's a silly moment. And I feel like if they had got given you a more proper Hulk payoff later on, I would have been fine with it. But now it just kind of feels like flat. It kind of feels like this individual moment that confirms why Hulk feels kind of wasted in this movie. But, you know, I digress. Uh, they steal the the Tesseract. You have a Captain from 2012 versus 2019 moment. Actually, excuse me, they're five years in the future, so it's a 2022 Captain. So it's 10 years apart, Captain America versus Captain America. And there's kind of a funny moment there where even Captain America present acts like he's so tired of like the Boy Scout talking points and everything of 2012 Cap. So that that's kind of funny. You see that. There's one issue I have with that, though, because uh, 2012 Captain America beats the shit out of 2019 Cap. And it's only when 20 or sorry, 2023 or 2022, whatever Cap. And it's only when future Cap basically gets the past Cap to let his guard down by saying, Bucky's alive that he's able to get a cheap shot in and basically win. And it's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. This other Captain America, past Captain America, just fended off the Chitauri invasion. He is beat to shit and done. And he just took Future Cap's lunch money. What the hell is that about? That You just have to accept that at face value. I haven't seen any explanation of that. But, you know, whatever. Uh, But they end up losing the Tesseract uh, due to a funny moment with present time Hulk smashing through the stairs and knocking Tony down. Of all people, Loki picks it up and escapes. So in this now alternate timeline, Loki has escaped. Professor Hulk, meanwhile, goes and has an interaction with the Ancient One, and he gets the Time Stone from it. Because there's three stones in this at once. You have the Time Stone, the Space Stone, which is the Tesseract, and what was the other one that was there? There was one more stone that was there, I feel like, but I can't think of which one off the top of my head right now. So the only one they get is the Time Stone, uh, they use that, or no, sorry, they don't use the time stone. They use their last pin particle jump to go to the 70s and take more pin particles and the Tesseract Stone from an earlier part of the timeline. But you learn from the interaction with Hulk and the Ancient One that every time they go back in time, they're not changing the past. You can't change the past in this. What you're doing is you're creating tangents, uh, alternate realities, basically, where everything to that moment in history is perfect in a straight line but when you go back in time your future self is what's going back so it's not like your past self never went back you're going back and you're creating these alternate branches basically of reality and to correct it they have to put all of the stones back because the stones are literally the fabric of the universe so having all of these stones you have to put them back in place otherwise you can have more chaos uh, ensue but if you put them back then these alternate realities the timeline will self-correct and be back on a linear path. So there are some weird rules to time travel in this movie. They keep riffing on Back to the Future 2. But I don't know that it completely pans out in any time travel movie. It's going to get complicated and sticky. But, you know, whatever. Let's uh, let's see what we can do. So they get the, the Tesseract. Uh, you have Thor, who I don't like what they do with Thor in this movie. Uh, when they find Thor in the future, five years in the future, you find that he's completely broken. He's lost everything. He's racked with his guilt because as he talks, even in infinity, infinity war, his might and his vengeance will fix everything. Well, he, he effed up. He, he didn't go for the head. As Thanos said, he allowed everyone to die. He had the power and the ability, but he let his own pride, his own need for vengeance. He wanted Thanos to suffer. He wanted to grind the ax literally in Thanos's chest, make him know exactly what's happening and then do it and he he screwed up and as a result 
half of all existence died and he's lost his people he lost his father his mother his brother and now he's lost all this so he has next to nothing he has maybe a fourth of the asgardian population left they're living on earth interestingly enough where in thor ragnarok his father said this could be asgard just talking about like the place so that general area they've set up now and he's he's literally fat and broken like he doesn't care about anything he is just drinking beer all the time he has a huge belly he's got man boobs and all that and it was played for a nice laugh but they go with it the whole movie and i don't i don't agree with it um especially with the time travel elements i felt like there was ample opportunity to correct and have him go back to his badass form from infinity war because at the end of infinity war you're like man he messed up but you know what he's a badass like he's the best he's the most formidable looking avenger we have right now and you know yeah he hacked off Thanos' head at the beginning of the movie, but that's not even, like, treated as a moment of triumph. That's, like, a childish outburst because Thanos has accomplished everything and them killing him is just, like, a pity, anger thing because Thanos isn't even a threat anymore. He didn't even care to be a threat. He just wants to live out the rest of his days, be it two days, three days, or eternity. He doesn't freaking care. He just wants to live out his days, and however many are left, that's what he's going to take. So that's, that's it. Uh... But they don't correct Fat Thor. They go with it the whole movie. He still looks kind of badass with this true Viking look thing they get going. The crazy braided beard and the long hair. Like, he looks cool, except he's not in shape, and it's just whatever. Uh, Meanwhile, you have Rocket and Thor go back to the events of Thor 2. And they even kind of recap Thor 2, because people kind of gloss over Thor 2 as far as plot points. And they get the Reality Stone, which was in Jane... Uh, I don't. I think those are. I think that's unused footage. I don't think Natalie Portman came back for the movie, although she was at the premiere of Endgame, so maybe she did film something. Uh, so they get that, but Thor, he, he's broken. He can't do anything. But he has this interaction with his mother, who had like 13 lines in the entire franchise until this movie, and then she gets like 29 in this movie. Thor has this moment where he comes with her, and she knows that he's a Thor from the future, and it kind of sorts out to sort of right the ship, but they don't. Like I said, they don't have him get back to form. The big thing here is he takes Mjolnir and he returns to the future. And just like the Infinity Stones, well, one, we learn, okay, he is still worthy to wield Mjolnir despite everything. But we know with the Infinity Stones and with Mjolnir, uh, you can take stuff from the past, physical things, and bring it back to the future with you. Um, Elsewhere, like I said, you got, they basically assemble everything. But there's one timeline where they're having to get the Power Stone. You see the iconic beginning to Guardians of the Galaxy from a different perspective with Nebula and War Machine. Kind of a funny play there. But you get the weird thing, and this is this was a hang-up for me and for a lot of people with the movie. And again, this is nitpicking, but it is kind of an honest assessment. Uh, you have... Because, because Nebula is basically this cybernetic being at this point, more machine than human... Uh, There's a moment where, because she's back in 2014 when the Power Stone is being taken, Thanos, Gamora, and Nebula of that time basically are aware of their presence because the two Nebulas are on one network, and they're like cross-overriding memories, like it's projecting out from her eye, and they see uh, Gamora with these others talking about killing Thanos first, then showing that they do kill Thanos and Thanos kind of puts two and two together like they're not from our time they're from the future and in this future I've already accomplished my goal and Thanos even sees his death and he's like basically like ah a worthy death he doesn't even give a shit and the idea is he's like all right well they're messing with time they have a device that lets them go through time and so they lay a trap they capture real nebula before she can jump back with war machine and because the time difference might be a few seconds, they don't even notice she's... They, they don't even address that. You never see War Machine have a freak out of like, whoa, I came back, why didn't she? Maybe he thought her thing just didn't work, and it was like, kind of like, I'll get to that in a minute, uh, with Scarlet Witch and Hawkeye. But, okay, so there you go. Uh, she's she's captured, she's tortured, gets her ass kicked by 2014 Nebula, and they take her some cybernetic piece that kind of makes them look the same and has some kind of enhancement that allows her to talk with the Avengers and her wrist watch thing that lets her use the PIM particles 
She goes to the future and basically lays a trap to help Thanos and them from 2014 jump into the present and deal with that. So they're jumping 10 years into the... I kept saying 2022 or 2023. I guess it's 2024 because they come 10 years into the future uh, to deal with all of that. And that trap comes later. To get the Soul Stone, for some reason, again, I guess maybe because she felt like if they knew they wouldn't do it, Nebula of the Future does not tell any of the Avengers about the cost for getting the Soul Stone, even though she expresses an Infinity War that she knows full well because her own sister was sacrificed to get it. You have to give up something you love, a soul for a Soul Stone, and there is no going back. No matter how you change the timeline, no matter what Infinity Gauntlet snap wish you make, there's no going back. Gamora of of that timeline for her, the present timeline, is gone forever. Now, of course, we have 2014 Gamora still here, but she hasn't even defected to the Guardians yet, so she has no affiliation with them beyond her blood bloodline with Thanos and Nebula. Um, so they make the decision, you know, okay, one of these characters is going to have to die. It's either going to have to be Black Widow or Hawkeye. Hawkeye went off the rails after his family died. He starts just killing drug lords and all these bad people around the world, just vigilante murder, not even justice. And... Because he tested was the first one to test the whole thing with time travel and this theory, he was able to confirm it works. He had this moment with his family. He sees, oh my god, I can go back. They make clear that Bl- uh, Black Widow has no family, that the Avengers are her family, and that she's completely and utterly broken in these five years since it. So it's clear that even though they try and sabotage each other and they do fake outs, she's going to be who sacrifices herself, and she is. Now here's the thing for this. Some people say like, oh, I would have rather Hawkeye had killed himself. Well, it's... The Soul Stone sacrifice in particular is a gut-wrenching moment. So if Hawkeye had done it, who Hawkeye to most fans is just kind of like, eh, you know. Like, this is probably his best movie of the series. But you look at Hawkeye and it's like, okay, well, if he's laying dead at the bottom of the ravine or whatever there, kind of like Gamora was and now in this one, like Black Widow is, do you have that real emotional pull where you're just like, oh, oh no. No, you don't. You don't, you don't, you don't. If it's Black Widow who you've at least cared a little bit more about, then I think that that moment carries more weight. And that's why they did it. They needed the first gut punch moment where the only person that they know to go into the past for this mission did not return. Uh, so she's gone for good. Black Widow's gone for good. Um, and even though there's a prequel, a Black Widow prequel that's going to come out, I think Portman, sorry, Portman, uh, Scarlett Johansson might actually be a producer on it. I don't know if she's directing or writing or anything like that, but she has some huge involvement with it beyond just acting. I know that much. Um, what's another one? I feel like I still skipped over something. When Tony came back after getting the formula, I cycle back real quick. Um, his one condition was that they didn't change the events of the last five years. So basically everyone snapped away. They stay gone those five years, but they come back to the present because he doesn't want to overwrite his child, his life, and all of that in the last five years. Fair point. That does create other chaos if you think about it because they're not undoing the snap. They're just taking basically all the people who die and like, poof, you're back to life five years in the future. You've not aged in those five years. Um, But yeah, okay, jumping back to where I was. So Black Widow doesn't come back. They got all the stones. Uh, They make the gauntlet. They create basically an Iron Man gauntlet uh, for the Infinity Stones And they're trying to figure out who will do it. Thor wants to do it because he thinks he's the strongest, but he's not in the shape to do it. Uh, And they're pretty much under under the impression. They understand Thanos was barely able to survive it in Infinity War, the snap. That's why he was sucked into the Soul Stone as a means of protecting him. And then he wound up going to the farm, and he destroyed the Infinity Stones using themselves uh, to make sure no one else ever got it. So they know this is could kill. There's a backlash to it using the stone or using the gauntlet. And they discuss it, and there's a callback all the way to the first Avengers where we know at least the Tesseract puts off gamma radiation. Uh, Low levels, they tell us, but Hulk, Professor Hulk, basically says, it's like I was made for this. All right, bro, whatever you want to say. Just to have Hulk comply. Hulk does the snap, undoes everything, tries to bring back Black Widow, but it doesn't work. His arm is all effed up, kind of like Thanos is. It's all destroyed up the arm. And his arm is useless. Hulk has like a healing factor not maybe not as high as Wolverine's, but he has a crazy healing factor too. They've talked about like, oh, I put a bullet in my mouth and the other guy spit it out. So it's not it's that crazy of a defense mechanism and a healing factor, and yet his his arm is just ruined the rest of the movie, even to the very end. So weird. 
Uh, so he does that, brings the snap back. They get the confirmation that all these other people are back. And it's like, oh my God, we did it. We did it. And then, phew, Thanos' warship, 2014 Thanos has arrived because in the midst of all this, Nebula has gone, redone, reverse engineered basically the thing to bring them back in. And you have just this massive attack. Realistically speaking, his uh, air to ground missiles, whatever you want to call it, his ballistic missiles should have killed everybody in there. Maybe Hulk would have survived. But Ant-Man for sure is standing just in front of a regular glass window. The whole compound is blown to hell, collapses in hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of feet, miles down potentially. And <laughs> it's just we go into the final battle. And so Thanos lands, stands there, and he's got this giant double-edged sword, and he's ready to fight. And then here comes Iron Man, here comes Fat Thor, in his Viking armor, and here comes Captain America, and you're like, okay, this is good. This is the three central most figures in the MCU. The main people we have built this entire 22 film arc around, they're going to go one-on-one, or sorry, three-on-one with Thanos. Now, granted, Thanos in Infinity War already had most of the stones, and yet he put up a good fight, so you feel like, oh, well, this Thanos three-on-one shouldn't be able to do that. You're going to have to bypass that. you got to have a film. Thanos kicks the shit out of all of them. Uh, Tony's vision starts to come true in the sense that uh, Thanos takes everything from Stormbreaker and is able to fend it off. He's breaking Captain America's shield to the point where it's half a shield. I mean, it's just chaos everywhere with this whole thing. And he's beating the shit out of them. Iron Man looks like he can't do anything. And there's this moment of gloom because you see Thanos' army showing up. Like the the Tachari are there. Those Leviathan giant sp- flying space slug things are there. Uh, his warships are coming down. You see his, his minions from Infinity War are there. And you're just like, holy shit. Well, if you recall, they undid the snap. So as Captain America tightens his what's left of his shield to his arm... Uh, oh, there's also a cool moment too. I almost passed over the... Not that I forgot it. It's that I forgot the order of it. Before Captain America's shield is broken, there's a badass moment where Thanos is doing the reverse of the stab the Stormbreaker through the chest of Thor and it's kind of reliving to some extent that just reversed. And then you see Mjolnir, which Thor has been using with Stormbreaker, suddenly lift and fly into the hands of Captain America. Captain America, as the payoff for Avengers 2, has proven himself worthy. And he starts for a minute beating the shit out of Thanos before Thanos overwhelms him, even with Mjolnir. Um, anyway, so Cap tightens the shield. Uh, he's he's staring down this arm and, and you know, the idea they're trying to sell, like, okay, this is it. They're going down, but they're going to go down fighting. Then you get all the sling rings showing up from the wizards and everything. Doctor Strange has brought everybody back. You have Spider-Man, you have the Asgardians, you have the you have Black Panther, you have Spider-Man, you have Pepper Potts is there. It's basically everybody and everything. Uh, you have the Wakandan army there. I mean, it's just chaos, like massive, massive battle suddenly. And then you get this interesting event where it's like, okay, they're still chasing after the gauntlet. And they're trying to get the gauntlet away from Thanos because they know all the obvious threat there. And so you have this keep away where like Spider-Man and Hawkeye and uh, all these other people are basically trying to keep the gauntlet away. Thanos' army is going nuts. You have these then tearjerker reunions. And I admit, a couple of these did hit me hard to the point where I did legit tear up. Felt the, felt the single manly tear roll down my cheek even. I was not expecting that. But you get the whole event. You get the payoff of the reunion with Iron Man and Tony Stark, their father-son moment, Peter Parker says in that. Uh, For him, it was almost like he blinked. It was like he felt himself fade away, and then he woke up, and they were gone. But then Doctor Strange shows up, and it brings them all into the battle. So all these people, they're like, they just came back to life. And then it's like, onward, into battle, all of you. We're fighting Thanos. By the way, it's ten years or five years in the future. Make of that what you will. Like, shit. Okay. (laughs) So you get just this this chaos and everything and yeah uh massive battle uh scarlet witch comes in she actually is the one who kicks the most shit out of thanos because you gotta remember it was thanos with the infinity stones that beat her before and you know she does the whole you took everything from me and thanos the past thanos he's like i don't even know who you are like i haven't done it and then she hits the cheesy return line you will all right that was a little ham-fisted 
Uh, I mentioned earlier, check that one off the list for these kind of moments that they want to have where it's like they're trying to appeal to everybody. There's one moment where Captain Marvel shows up. She just pew, torpedoes through the entire Thanos ship. Uh, she, man, I think, I think Brie Larson's good, like, for the role. I do think, however, they make her a little overpowered. I know in the comics she's one of the strongest and one of the best, but her powers come from the Tesseract, basically the Space Stone, and I feel like it largely is allowed to outweigh the other ones. I'm sure someone's going to correct me on that uh, for why that is and why it makes total sense. I digress. Uh, she goes toe-to-toe with Thanos briefly. Uh, well, here, I'm getting ahead of myself again. The check-the-box moment. You have this moment where she has the gauntlet. She takes it from Spider-Man, and to kind of help her, you have literally every other female in the cast of the good guys there to fight with her. And it's kind of like, okay, setting aside the odds that all of you are in the same place at the same time to do this, it felt a little forced. Yeah, I know that it's like a, hey, let them have their moment. I'm cool with that. I don't, I don't, I didn't care personally. To me, I was just like, in my head, I was like, okay, check that box. Like, moving on. Some people got really hung up about it. To me, it was just like, okay, whatever. I mean, cool. They're having their moment. I'll set aside, you know, suspension of disbelief. I'll set that aside and uh, just roll with it because I know it's just a little moment in the grander scheme of everything. Uh, So she ends up going toe-to-toe with Thanos. Um, Thanos gets the gauntlet in the whole mix. And he has these, for some reason, instead of just, (laughs) it's a little, (laughs) Thanos is a little extra with his thing. He gets the gauntlet and he does his like, thing again when he gets it. And then he's like, no, to snap. And he raises his arm straight up. And he, he like wants to do this dramatic like on everything. And because he because he's so fucking extra about it, she flies up and like grabs his hand, stops him from snapping. Uh, he headbutts her. She doesn't even budge. She kind of like arrogantly smiles at him. <laughs> There's a nice moment. He takes the power stone out of the gauntlet, holds it in just his bare fist. And then with the power stone, just punches the shit out of her she flies off screen you don't even see her again until the final minutes of the movie i was kind of like oh now here's the thing i think they did i think they did the best they could do with her in that case she still played a pivotal role she still got her moments in where you build her up as strong but they didn't let her be the do sex machina completely to the solution and she got humbled just a little bit there at the end i think that worked well um but Thanos still has the stone, so he's going again to, you know, he puts the power stone back and he goes again to do the snap. And this time, Tony, like, basically grabs onto him. Keep in mind, it's Tony's gauntlet. It's his, it's an Iron Man gauntlet. It's nanotech. And so he does that, and because he's wearing a thing, basically as he's grabbing it, it's it looks like he's just weakly wrestling with Thanos. Thanos is just kind of like, get off of me, you fly. Kind of swats him away, but because it's the nanotech and because it literally meshes with Tony's suit... He's able to take the Infinity Stones into that. So they're out of that gauntlet Thanos has. They go to two Iron Mans. Moments earlier, uh, you know, in Doctor Strange's in Infinity War, he gives them, like, there's... I'm looking at all the possible futures. There are 14,600,005, and only in one of them did we win. Now we're in the end game. So Tony asks him earlier in the battle, is this the one in which we win? To which Doctor Strange says, if I tell you, it won't happen. And it's because he knows what has to happen. And so uh, there's a moment when Captain America, sorry, uh, Captain Marvel is tied up with Thanos where Tony looks again to Doctor Strange and Doctor Strange very timidly kind of tells him like he holds up like a one, like kind of a low and down one trying to signal like this is the one. I'm not going to tell you what has to happen. I'm just going to I'm just going to give some little subtle sign. This is the one. So then Tony takes it. He's got all the stones. And then he hits you with this just epic callback to 2008's Iron Man uh, at the very end before he gives this, you know, Thanos is like, as he thinks he has the stone and goes to do the snap, he's, uh, or the, the gauntlet with all the stones, he goes to do the snap, he's like, I am inevitable. like oh shit i don't have any of them he looks over and he sees them going into form on the iron man gauntlet or glove whatever for the suit and then he hits him with the iconic line i am iron man he does his snap and thanos and all of his army crumble away all the army first and then thanos not even another word not even like a 
rah, just kind of like sits down on a stump and just kind of looks around, understanding he's been beaten. And that's that. Thanos crumbles away. Tony takes the same kind of blowback damage like Professor Hulk had. And like I said earlier, you don't get the epic moment between Thanos and Hulk in the rematch. That kind of ticked me off. Hulk's arm is still ruined. It's in a sling at this point, or not quite yet. Uh, but Tony drops down. He's dying. He, his, his body, he's a mortal body even with the suit. He cannot survive it. He doesn't have another line. He's got like a thousand yard stare. Spider-Man now does the reverse of his line where he's grabbing on to Tony and it's another gut-wrenching moment. I got a little emotional there as well. And Pepper Potts shows up. She's in one of the Iron Man suits. And some people were confused by her interaction with Tony. I think it was actually perfect. Again, if you recall, but Iron Man 3, Tony couldn't sleep. He was having panic attacks. He has carried this massive burden forever, pretty much, since the events of the 2012 Avengers. Uh, This fear that he has to protect and help everybody, that he has to save everybody. And it's this just crushing burden that has caused him untold psychological harm and stress and anxiety. And so she's telling him. She's like, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, when they're slipping away, they're already dealing with their distress. The last thing that loved one needs is to see you falling apart and understanding that they're the cause for your burden. So it's kind of like, be strong for them. You have the rest of your life to fall apart over this moment, but be strong for them in that moment. And that's what she does. Uh, She tells Tony, it's okay. You can rest now, because he literally couldn't rest in Iron Man 3. You can rest now. We're all safe. And Tony doesn't say anything else. You just kind of see him just... That's it. Iron Man has Iron Man has died. Like she checked his vitals. It was it, the suit already said that he was slipping away rapidly. Uh, no final words other than the I am Iron Man and that's it. We flash forward then to his funeral. More gut-wrenching moments. You see everybody there. Nick Fury's there. Uh, the Guardians are there. Basically the entire MCU in terms of significant characters. There's one person people were wondering who the hell it was. It was the kid from Iron Man 3 in the back, the boy. Uh, They don't mention him by name because it would have been too ham-fisted to force it in there. But that's who that Easter egg was. Uh, They had their moment in Iron Man 3, and it specifically called to the whole panic attacks and being safe and all that. So for what that's worth, that was there. Uh, You have a nice moment for the director of Iron Man 1, Happy Hogan, who is a character. Uh, Happy Hogan is the character in this case. Uh... In the movie, he's having a moment with Tony's daughter. And a callback again, another Easter egg to Iron Man 1. When Tony first gets back from the desert, he basically says uh, the first thing he wants is a hamburger. The daughter, what she wants after Tony's death, is the hamburger. Uh, There's this recording you get right before the actual funeral of Tony, his projector one. And you see that this is something he recorded before he took the answer to time travel to the Avengers, understanding he may never see his family again. So he has his goodbye message for everyone there. I know that choked a lot of people up again as well. Uh, Just that's largely it. Uh, At the end, you have this moment with Scarlet Witch and with Hawkeye and Hawkeye is kind of like, you know, I wish she knew he's talking about Black Widow. I wish she knew her sacrifice was worth it, that we won. And Black Widow gives, or sorry, uh, Scarlet Witch gives kind of a, I I was a little confused. I'm a little bit in disagreement with some people I've seen talk about this. Basically, she says, she knows, both of them do. And you're kind of like, who's, who's the other one here? Who are we talking about? Who else knows? Some people said, oh, Gamora, because she was also in the stone. And the soul stone, it's kind of like you still exist in that soul stone. I could understand that. Interestingly, I was going to say controversially, not so much controversially, just surprisingly, they didn't bring back Vision. And I've had all kinds of discussion on this. Vision was not, it was the Mind Stone, which is where Scarlet Witch's powers come from as well, and that's part of why she had that connection with Vision, um, where his powers came from. So the only guess I have, somebody feel free to correct me and let me know in the comments. My only guess is that the reason he doesn't come back is because he is literally artificial intelligence. It's basically Jarvis with a little bit of personality, a little more personality um, that Vision's made of. His life force comes from the Infinity Stone uh, in his head, so the Mind Stone. So 
That's why he doesn't come back, I'm guessing. I thought that's who Scarlet Witch was referring to, her love interest and her everything that she lost in Infinity War. I thought she meant Natalie, Black Widow, and Vision were aware. To which, if it's Vision, I'm like, how the hell would he know? <laughs> He's deactivated AI. You know, and people talked about how when he went grayed out when he was killed in uh, Infinity War, like, oh, that's a reference to in the comics where he comes back and he's like, that's like the design kind of for him and everything. Uh, he doesn't come back, but that that wraps up their interaction. Just like, oh, they know they're they're happy or something. Um, like I said, Gamora can't come back. Present line, Gamora can't come back. But 2014, Gamora defected at the start of the battle, the final battle to uh, the good guy side because she understood Thanos does this and I know what he does is wrong. So she defects. Future Nebula kills past Nebula because she couldn't turn on her father yet. There just wasn't enough there for her to do it quite yet. And all that happened during the battle. I skimmed over it because it's little smaller beats. Uh, Then we move forward into the end where Captain America is taking back. He's got Mjolnir still, by the way. Uh, cause Thor has Stormbreaker and he's happier with that one than he is Mjolnir. And so Captain America goes back to the past to return each of the infinity stones goes alone. It's kind of a wrap up and there's contra- this is where I was talking about regarding the timeline and how the alternate realities are supposed to collapse back into the main one. Right? So how does he not create paradoxes and issues with this? They actually kind of swat away the idea of a paradox, but he returns every Infinity Stone and then refuses to come back, and he lives out his payoff back with the love of his life, Peggy Carter, from Captain America, the first Avenger. So he stayed basically in the 40s, went back, I guess, maybe his last jump instead of coming to the present, went back even further to the 40s with all the Infinity Stones returned. And basically that version of Captain America just stayed out of it. He understood whatever's going to happen has to happen, has to be how it is. And uh, even though the other me is frozen in ice and we're going to do this whole cycle... This me is going to stay here. So, yeah. Uh, like I said, with the stones return, those realities should have collapsed into each other. So it's like, is he with the original Peggy Carter? Or is this an alternate reality Peggy Carter? And what about the life she was supposed to have? Because if you recall in uh, Civil War, I believe it was, uh, he kind of he kind of had a thing, a little something-something going with Peggy Carter's granddaughter, which was fucking weird. And I'm glad they didn't carry that onward. But, yeah, he, he kind of had like a little moment there with her and it's like okay well now she doesn't exist because now she married captain america her husband her family all that you're rewriting all of that uh that's a little morally gray you could argue and he basically just ages back you get old man cap where instead in the present he's just kind of standing there waiting on him and he's like in his 90s and he gives over the shield people were a little bothered because before he does the time jump he kind of has this final moment with bucky and then he instead has a final moment with sam the falcon uh, and he gives him the shield, and he's basically like, you're Captain America now. And you're like, wait, what? Like, why is his like final moment of the series with Sam, who he's known for about five years in the story, and who just came back? He's been longer than five years, whatever, seven years, I don't know. And who just came back after a five-year absence uh, in the snap, so did Bucky. But Bucky, he has history with literally his entire life before he was even Captain America. So that was a little controversial. I feel like... Falcon doesn't generate much interest. The Winter Soldier's a strong enough property on his own, even though they're literally going to have a show together on Disney+. Plus. Um, but I think that's where they were going with it, where they're like, I don't know, let's bolster Falcon a little bit. And I know the Falcon was Captain America for a time in the comics. Calm down. So was Winter Soldier, so calm down. Um, but that's the payoff there, is Captain America's retired. Black Widow is dead. Vision's still gone. Uh, 20... 20- 24 or whatever year it is at this point gamora is still gone but now past gamora is there and she never had that relationship with the guardian so they're gonna go look for her now thor is now tagging along that's the weird thing thor has no arc left he has nothing left he even gives up his kinghood basically of the remaining as guardians and gives it to the valkyrie i forget her name but the valkyrie uh from ragnarok and i thought that was a strange kind of decision and he's tagging along with the guardians and they make the joke which is a comic series uh the as guardians of the galaxy and he's still fat thor and so they kind of like all right we're gonna go look for gamora now like okay interesting um i don't know so phase three so that's that's end game 
uh the main cast is all gone uh i don't know how to feel moving forward with it i'll still see a guardians 3 i'll still go see spider-man far away from home uh which is technically the last film in phase three i think that's a weird decision it should have ended with endgame um but there's still going to be tie-ins there i'm excited for spider-man because i think tom holland is a great spider-man but i have reservations about uh kind of you know they couldn't reboot spider-man for the third time in a two decade span so uncle ben was effectively replaced even though he existed and it all happened still in the universe the importance of uncle ben was replaced with tony stark and even though they created a gut-wrenching narrative with that and all that now he's too tied to tony to the point where the spider-man suit is literally an iron man suit i don't want that i don't think that's the right call i don't know if the answer is just to have the iron man suit the iron spider suit basically break and tony not around to fix it and therefore, all right, there it is. Uh, I can take some stuff from it that I can figure out and engineer myself. But other than that, I'm just going to have to go to a kind of new, more classic Spider-Man suit. I don't know. I really don't know what that answer is. But all I can say is I'm excited for that film. I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm still cautiously optimistic for Guardians 3, even though, even though now it looks like Thor is going to be a part of that. I don't know what arc he has left. And other than that, man... I look at the rest of the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and I'll see the stuff, I'm sure. But I'm at a weird impasse. Like, I know there's going to be a Black Panther 2. I know there's going to be things like that. And they'll all see them. But, man, you build 22 film narrative, like a single narrative over the course of 22 films. When that narrative's complete, you're kind of like, where am I supposed to go? Like, what am I supposed to do? I, I don't know what to do with my life after this. That's kind of how it feels. So, man, like I said, you can nitpick this movie to death. I obviously just went through a lot of stuff there. I think I give it a solid 9 out of 10. I think I think the first act was brilliant in how slow, deliberately slow of a pace it was. Because the best thing it does is it makes you look at these guys not as superheroes, but as people. You see them as characters. You see them... As just people, and you get rich, rich character development, which as a writer, I love that. I, I, th I thought Infinity War, as much as I enjoyed it, and as well as I thought they did juggling it, I felt like the pace was too frenetic at times, and it just felt like you were just hopscotching from one thing to the next. Here, I felt like you had time to let stuff breathe. You had time to really look into the characters. And you had all these great payoffs, too. When they go into the 70s, for instance, uh, to get the the uh, tesseract after the initial botch you have a moment with tony and his father and it closes up even that narrative arc for him and his father issues and everything dating back to like iron man 2 and 1 and there's just great payoff to that you get that moment you get the closure for uh barton hawkeye and his family you get uh iron man and peter you get i mean just across the board you get all of this great uh, closure and character payoff. I don't think there was really any that they ignored that I was like, oh, they should have done that. Um, I had one joke for an observation they should have made. This is this would have been a, a, a joke um, that I had the thought. You know, they, they play the joke where when Thor's joining the Asgardian, or sorry, the Guardians of the Galaxy at the end, like, oh, who's really in charge? If you remember in Infinity War, Hulk was still like the chiseled god and they're constantly making jokes about how like, no, that's a man right there. That's an angel pirate, as Drax was calling him. Uh, that's a that's a real man and all that. So when Thor is joining him at the end and he's Fat Thor, they should have had some reference calling back to that. Like that feels like a Star Lord moment where he's gonna point out like, oh, he's not so hot anymore, is he? You know, just I mean, obviously a line would be written better than that. That's just literally off the top of my head something I thought of. But it felt like there should have been a better payoff moment like that where it's like, ooh, wow. That's a rare chance for you to miss a callback, and you're usually really good about that. But, you know, it is what it is. I think the payoff was good. I think it uh, felt rewarding and felt like a proper conclusion. You can say, hey, Th Thanos wasn't super visionary with his uh, gauntlet. I know he only had it for a second, and he didn't even get it to use it in this film. But other than the snap, Thanos doesn't do a hell of a lot. He throws a moon at him in Infinity War. Uh, he doesn't do a whole lot. You know, I know he moves through space at times with the space stone, the Tesseract stone, basically. But I don't know. I just, I still feel like there was a little bit of a missed opportunity in that. But it is what it is, man. I, I would have liked it better if one of the deaths that we suffered at the end of this 
uh, occurred in battle. Like, when Tony got stabbed in Infinity War, a half second, for a half second, I did think, oh, this is his, this is his death. He's going to be the devastating loss they suffer other than the snap. Like, as far as one of their crucial leaders being gone, I thought, oh, wow, this is going to be it because he just stabbed them through the chest, basically. That doesn't happen. I think if they'd had a moment like that where one of the major deaths in an end game was suffered in that kind of way, I think it would have put Thanos over even more because Thanos is fighting without the Infinity Stones this entire movie, and you still see how fucking formidable he is. And I think that would have put it over the top where you're like, dude, like, he just killed Thor. And, you know, I love Chris Hemsworth as Thor. I thought for him being the big Lebowski, which they even joke about in this movie, he does a good job with it, but I just didn't like the direction for Thor. Um, just like I didn't like the direction for Professor Hulk. Basically, he only existed as Professor Hulk just to do the snap of his own, and then he was more or less worthless the rest of the time. Uh, I think if he had killed Thor in battle, Thanos had, without the gauntlet or anything, I think that would have really, really put it over. And maybe have it where Thor even saves somebody, right? Like Thor failed to save everybody, the universe, half the universe. Uh, have him lay his life down to save Tony or something like that or Captain America. Uh, if he does that and then is killed in the process, some kind of visceral death like being stabbed or something, that would have had tremendous weight behind it, I think. As is... The only deaths in the end are basically the blowback from the snap or the snap itself. And to me, that felt like a little bit of a PG-13 cop-out. It is what it is. But that's uh, that's my review now that I've been talking for an hour about Endgame. That's how, uh, that's how I feel about it. And uh, I think I'm going to go back now and go through the entire 22 film series piece by piece and do a movie. Not every movie is going to get an hour, obviously, but I'm going to talk about the film itself kind of how it fits into the larger developing universe as it goes. They'll probably be like 15-minute reviews. And for Cheap Pop, we're going to cover all 22 films, again, with another in-game review at that point. So stay tuned.